cheers for having me back on guys um we were on what two weeks ago talking about complete dentures first and we're going to do some partials today so i want to do the completes first because actually it flows quite nicely and i think if you can master the complete denture and the basic principles behind that partials become a lot more simple whether it's a complicated partial case like the one i'll show towards the end um, you know, if you use the principles of complete dentures, then that's really great. If it's a simple one, then it's probably going to be a lot easier. So the first one on completes, if you missed it, will be coming out soon. So you can watch them both. Um, but let's just run through a quick bit of what we're going to cover today. I want to go through sort of the similarities and the differences in sort of when you're planning for completes and partial dentures. I want to go through sort of the importance of adapting a stock tray for taking your primary impressions. And again, we sort of covered it a bit with the completes, but it becomes even more important for your partials. And we'll go through that and then sort of appreciate the scope of uh, partial dentures, sorry, and the you know considerations in doing whole mouth planning or, you know, full mouth dentistry rather than single tooth dentistry and using partial dentures to aid in more sort of full mouth rehabilitation, which as a student always sounds quite scary, but actually if you're looking for it, it's something you see quite a lot in practice. So it's a good thing to try and get your head around early. And those principles of complete and partial dentures really forms the basis of that. So a little bit for anyone who wasn't on last time uh, and just another casual plug. Um, my name's Rupert. I went to King's. I graduated coming to five years ago in 2017. And I now work solely in private practice uh, just outside Reading. Um, I live in London, so that was fun getting back today in time with the tube strikes. And working in private practice, it's a referral centre, um, but I mostly have an interest in removal prosthodontics, but I do all areas of general dentistry, uh, bar root canals and perio. Uh, I'm a, on the committee for the Young ITI, which is an implantology network. Uh, we have a really cool event coming up in a few weeks' time in London, and we're planning something up in the north in October so keep your eyes out for that should be a fun day and I do a lot of stuff on Instagram for dentures sharing cases and tips so all the pictures I think more or less that you'll see tonight are all on my Instagram with various other little bits so make sure you check that out uh, and through Instagram I run a live session uh, which is also a podcast called Impression Club which is sort of covering all areas of dentistry and I might refer to a few of the episodes um, because they're 45 minutes an hour on a certain topic and that might be handy to, to listen to as well as extra stuff uh, and I also do a newsletter uh, which is open source so anyone can submit stuff to that if you want to get that free newsletter head over to www.impressionclub.co.uk and then one last plug I've got a course coming out soon called the art of completes uh, and as I joked last time the first time I was on this webinar series in February 20. 21 we was still upcoming and it's still upcoming but we'll get there so let's get on to the point today partials the thing and the theme anyway that we're going to go through is partials are just completes but they've got some teeth so we need to think of it like that so the main thing to think about is we need to treat those edentulous areas i.e those areas without any teeth like it's a complete denture in terms of taking impressions in terms of how you register the bite so this case here, for instance, isn't too bad, but if we've got that free end saddle, that distally extending area without any teeth, we need to consider that that is the same as a complete denture and how we're going to tackle that moving forwards. Obviously we need to consider the teeth that remain. So we need to look at perhaps guide planes or tooth preparation. This is maybe something that's a little bit more relevant when it comes to chrome dentures, which I'm not gonna cover in any great detail today. But essentially what we're talking is your guide planes are sort of multiple parallel surfaces that the denture is going to slide down. And if you can have as many of these parallel surfaces as you can, you're going to get a better friction. For instance, if we look back towards, see if the pointer is going to work. If we look back towards the lower right side there, we've got that lower right six, it's very glitchy that lower right six or seven there that's leaning forwards you know that could be really leaning you know this patient maybe was missing this tooth for a while that seven is leant forwards and then your denture is going to sit down in that area so we're going to end up with a big space here where food will get stuck 
So we need to consider, do we need to adjust this tooth to upright it a little bit, polish it so we get a better fit? Or do we look at our path of insertion for the denture? That's also part of your surveying your casts and things like that. Can we look at a path of insertion that allows the denture to slide down in that position? But we also, part of our surveying, we want to look at undercuts for clasps and things like that. Often it's more planning involved because there's lots of other restorative work. There are other teeth, there might be perio, there might be decay. There's lots of other things that could be going on. So that's always something to think about. And as we're gonna show with the case later on, it can be more complicated in terms of rehabilitating a patient rather than just conforming. You know, this case here, quite simple, um, but there are other cases that can be a lot more complicated. And like this one demonstrates really nicely, if you're going to look at some cosmetic work, the gum match is a lot more important. My technician got very, very excited about doing this case when I said to him, yeah, absolutely, you can look at that recession, you can uh, you know, get stuck in there, use some stains, do some recession. He got really excited about that. But you know, in a cosmetic partial case, that's a lot more important because obviously a complete, it's uniform. So let's go over some anatomy again because that's how we started the complete. We'll look at that free end saddle. So that the area we're talking about there on this patient's upper left, this whole area extended here and the palate, of course, that is all essentially a complete denture. And then we've got some teeth in the way for the rest of it. So we, we covered sort of the tr uh, stability triangle last time, the importance for successful dentures. We want stable, solid dentures. Nine times out of 10, when a patient says they've got a loose denture, they mean it's not stable. And stability is that balance between your support and your retention. So your support is that resistance towards the tissues, towards the gums, towards the teeth, particularly in, in biting. And your retention is that resistance away from the tissues. And that's where your clasps and your flanges come into it. So things to consider with this case, I'm going to briefly just run through models. Patient, unfortunately, um, wasn't keen on uh, any full face pictures or anything like that. So I thought I'd just stick to this. So things we need to consider, we still want to get really nice impressions of our tuberosities because we want to get as much distal extension as we can. Now, Keen-eyed among us may have realized that this area here looks a little bit unusual. So actually, there's a lot of scar tissue here. So this patient actually, she had a pretty, pretty tough time, um, had a, I think it was the seven first extracted, uh, and she got what we call an OAC, which is a join between her, her nose and her mouth, essentially the roots of the tooth are right up into that sinus. So when they've come out, it's made a connection. And part of the surgery to try and repair that actually led to her losing the six and then unfortunately losing the premolar as well. And she ends up with quite a large defect um, in, the, in the roof of the mouth, which got closed with a big flap. So they cut away the gum to stretch it over and cover it up. And that's resulted in all of this scar tissue here, which was very spongy but also the area where you get the gum from typically is on the cheek side and you pull it over in towards the palate to stitch it up. So she's got a very shallow sulcus down here. So we've not got a lot to work with. So how are we gonna look at taking these impressions? The first thing we've got to consider is I always say, you've got to build an impression, particularly a primary impression. You've got to build an impression, you don't take one. Again, we covered this in the completes lecture. What I mean by that essentially is, you know, take the sort of phrase of taking an impression out of your vocabulary. You've got to think, right, I've got to build this. Now a stock tray by definition, yes, it's small, medium and large, but a stock tray doesn't fit anyone. As soon as you sort of appreciate that, the better you're going to do, the better your primary impression is going to be, the better then your secondaries are going to be, and the easier your secondaries are going to be. Um, I will point out these are secondary casts, um, but this, the same thing applies. So I'm going to show you the primary impressions that we took for this. Now, try and sort of use your, your mind's eye here as we've got those teeth hanging down, we've got that space there. If I try and just put alginate straight in to this, I'm going to have a very thick area of alginate probably over the palate because the trays never extend upwards and she's got quite a narrow high palate. And now I'm going to have very, very thick alginate here. And that thick alginate is not going to be able to push that cheek out the way. I want to overextend that primary so I can see all of the anatomy. It's not going to push that material away and we're not going to get all of our detail here. 
So what I've done is I've added some putty. So I've got my stock tray. I've tried in the small, I've tried in the medium. I think the medium, the blue one's gonna be the best fit. And I've put, painted my silicon adhesive onto the pallet and the free end saddle area. And then I put the putty in and I press that right up. The one thing I didn't do before this picture or I didn't do in between is trim this away, the teeth indents and take another picture. I did trim them away, but I didn't take the picture. And the reason that you want to do that is essentially what you're doing with this putty is you're trying to make it more like that evenly spaced special tray that's going to be close up towards the gums and then have that space away from the teeth. So what you don't want is to have that tooth indent because you're not going to be able to get enough alginate into the little, the little divot of the indentation. So you want to cut that away, free it right up, and then you can load it with some alginate and take your impression over that. And it's a lot easier to get a really nice impression that way and um, get a good set of primary models. Now, remember, again, we said last time, the whole point of your special or your primary tray, sorry, your primary impression is twofold. Firstly, you're just looking to get a good set of trays made. So you wanna get all those big features, your tuberosities, your flanges, your free needle attachments and so on. But what you also want to be doing is in the case for partials, getting good impressions of the teeth in particular so that you can do some planning potentially. For instance, with this case, if we go back to that cast there, you know, is the distal angle, the distal sort of fitting surface of that canine, is that matching up against the back of that six there? Can I get some nice guide planes against those? Do I need to do any alteration after we've surveyed it and things like that? So a little bit of sort of air blows or things like that we're not too concerned with, uh, but actually this is a really nice primary, actually very happy with it. The secondary, hopefully doesn't look much different because I've spent the time almost making a special tray. And here is the secondary, if it loads. No, there's a little video. Uh, you can see I haven't practiced this one too much. So this just sort of overlaps with that previous bit and just shows how we've added that bit in to support this uh, free end saddle area there. This is the secondary. There we go. So actually not much different at all. It's just tidier. So. The only real difference, we've got less material in because there's less sort of guesswork and overextension. And then the other thing to bear in mind, because of that less overextension is, for instance, if you look at the, uh, the saddle area here or the flange area, that bit in the secondary is just that little bit narrower. It's more of a functional um, sulcus because that's what we don't want. We've got a shallow sulcus already. We don't want to over push it up because then when she squeezes the lips around, it pushes it down. So again, we covered the border molding, the functional border molding in the other lecture, but just to quickly go over it again, this secondary I've taken just purely with the alginate, purely with the hydrogum, uh, and that is just sitting straight into that tray there. And then I'm loading that up, placing it in, and then for the upper there, I'm making sure it's away from the lips, pull that around, and then I'm going to get the patient to say, ooh, for me, squeeze the lips, and it massages the material down, a cheesy grin and saying, e, and that's going to pull it right up. And I get him to repeat that two or three times, e, ooh, e, ooh, and that's going to massage that material down, and it's going to show me the correct extension of the sulcus. And the other thing for uppers, as we mentioned, is I'm then going to get the patient to open their mouth wide and wiggle their jaw from left to right so that the coronoid process, the jutty up part of the mandible, knocks up against those tuberosities. And for the lower, we'll cover it again a bit later in the case there, because I don't have any, up, I didn't do a lower for this case. So once we've done that, we've got that resultant cast, as we've seen earlier. And then how are we going to go about making a stable denture? What's our design going to be? Remember that stability, that balance between retention and stability uh, and support, sorry. So where's our retention going to come from? We want to look for some clasps. Uh, we've already done as, as well as we can in terms of the sulcus and things like that. Uh, and the other thing to try and do, which is really, really nice on this model, is get a really good impression in between the teeth so that the collets of the denture can really get up in between you can see a beautiful sort of rolled sulcus uh, of the gingival margin there so you want to be able to get some nice detail there so this is the plan that we went for in the end and we've got three little clasps on this 
So we've got a little clear class, which is quite hard to see. Uh, I do have some pictures in the mouth on Instagram if you want to go and find it. Um, so there's a little clear clasp there. And then we've got two clasps on this. We've got one that's wrapping around the back of this tooth to grip onto the sixth there. And then one that's going over the occlusion with the little ball gripper there. And I wanted just to double up on that because my main worry is the support in this case. Yeah, it's that scar tissue area over on the other side. So my concern is that when the patient bites down on this area or bites down in general, this particular area here is a lot softer than the rest of the palate, which is obviously nice and firm. And what that means is that potentially that scar tissue there is going to indent down and the denture is going to rock that way because it's naturally just going to sink into that tissue. So I wanted those two clasps there for that extra grip, but that's also why I've added the seven on this side as well. I typically don't bother with sevens on dentures. They tend to get in the way, but we put a little tiny tooth on here just because what I wanted was when the patient bit down, she was biting on denture on both sides so that the denture couldn't flip because it was being pinned in by the occlusion more or less. Obviously, if they bite off to one side, it's going to give a little bit, but it couldn't rotate fully out. So that's why I've added that additional tooth there, just to help to press it down evenly and not allow it to rock quite so much. So based on that, Can I, I'm I want so to sorry, go through... I interrupt. Yeah, we can't see your pointer. Right we can't see your pointer um, on our screens. Just... Can you hear me? Nope. nope. Can you hear me now? Yep. Um, we can't see your pointer on the screen. Uh, so I'm just, I'm just waving this around like a nutter. Great. Yeah. <laughs> <so> <laughs> I did try messaging well, you at the I hope start, you understood. I don't think you know it. No, let me help. But yeah, just let you know. Oh, sorry, I can't see the sorry. messages. All good. All good. No problem. Uh, it's not letting me have a mouse up either. Um, let see if I can get it. Can annotate do something? Oh, oh. is that going to work? No, my mouse isn't working either. I'll just I'll just talk, uh, and hopefully it makes sense. Okay. So how do I get rid of this? Oh, this is a nightmare. Hold on, gang. Let me just close this up. Mm -mm -mm. Just carry on. So, can we get this out of the way? Oh, I hate Zoom so much. Mm -mm -mm. No. Is that little bar in the way? Nope. No, you can't see a little bar that says like mouse select text and all this nonsense at the top. No, it's just my computer. Yeah. Cool. I'll just ignore it. Fine. So, we're going to go through this case here. Lovely technical, technical glitch. We're not all sick of Zoom yet. So this case here is sort of a full mouth rehabilitation case. Okay, it's quite a complicated one. Uh, not something that you'd expect to be doing as a, as a student, but could well be something you do as, as an FD perhaps, or at least you could try and get stuck into as an FD after you graduate. So let's look a little bit closer at this chap here. So he came to see me, he wasn't overly happy with his teeth overall, he's not showing a lot of teeth. He was missing a few teeth. He didn't have a lower denture. Um, and the teeth that he did have, some were loose, some were broken, uh, and he just wanted to get it fixed. And this is a classic case of what we sort of mentioned earlier about sort of single tooth dentistry, sort of focusing on one issue and not looking at the big picture. Uh, so what I tried to do with this was do full mouth dentistry really look at the big picture here to build it all together properly um, i use the analogy a lot of it's a bit like the sort of crack in the wall in the cartoon the leaky wall you put your hand on one crack and then another leak springs up somewhere else and that's a little bit what's 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 happened with this gentleman here he's had a few different issues that have happened over time and as bits of treatment have been done they've just been what we say conforming into the um into the current occlusion and things like that. So we'll look a little bit closer. We can start to see uh, some quite warm teeth there on the bottom, some missing teeth, some short teeth. And then what we'll do is we'll just pull the lips back 
and then we can have a real good look. So there's a lot going on in this. So we've got some very wobbly teeth. We've got some pretty bad gum disease. So the upper sixes and that lower uh, sort of central incisor there are all grade three mobile, very, very mobile. Uh, we have a denture in place. We've got that central on the right hand side and then we've got those two premolars on the right but you can see they're very short they're not in the right position and um, the left central incisor that's actually a whole tooth it's not a broken tooth it's had some composite put on it's actually a buried uh, tooth i'm not really sure how that happened and then we've got a few broken roots uh, we've got some decay in this upper left four that's hanging down there and some quite serious tooth wear so you know what's happened over time is this gent's never had a lower denture and he's had what we call dento alveolar compensation so those top teeth that aren't posed they've gone looking for it which is why they're sort of hanging down and the bone is dropping there and you can see it starting to happen around those roots uh, up on the top left and then because he's not got any back teeth he's pushed his lower jaw forwards to try and bite on those front teeth and over the course of years and years and years that's causing to wear down and break as the other ones have but also what it's led to is as that jaw swings forwards, it overcloses. So his, his jaws are closer together, he's similar to the complete case again, which is overclosed. And then as a double whammy, he's then worn those teeth down as well. So his jaws are far, far closer together than they should be. If we have a little look to the sides, we can see some more of the issues there. So you can see how much these sixes are hanging down and the bite is just all over the place. So in this situation, he's, I think he's biting in the wrong place anyway. This isn't his natural original position with teeth, so we want to fix that. And obviously, we want to give him some more space so that we can build up these teeth and make it more aesthetic for him. So quite complicated. How do we start this? We just take an impression. Yeah, just take some impressions. Again, get a good special tray and do some planning. It's a lot easier if you've got some models to sit there and look at it and try and work out what to do. And also your technician has probably seen this hundreds of times. So again, I've done some putty in those edentulous areas. I took out the three very wobbly teeth before doing the impression. So those upper sixes that I took out, you can just about see the sort of indent um, or the in, uh, sort of inverted part of that upper right six where I think it was there. Um, and I took out the lower incisor as well because I was worried that I was just going to pull those out with the uh, with the impression. I haven't cut out that upper right wisdom tooth. So there's a wisdom tooth up there. It's actually sort of partly uh, submerged. I didn't cut that one out. I just sort of hollowed it out because I wanted to get that really nice impression of the, uh, of the stalkus up there using the putty. So I didn't trim that bit away. And then coming up is the probably the worst impression that I'll ever show in a lecture. Not the prettiest thing at all, but actually I think I've overextended it a bit too much, the putty at the back, which is why I've got this sort of step in the, in the alginate there. But the main thing, as we said, is the big picture. I've got a really good overextended sulcus. I've got where those tuberosities are and we can make the tray. Yeah, so I'm not too concerned. All I can do is add a bit of putty at the back because I think I'm probably going to have a bit of a space there. So I'll add some putty at the back in the secondary impression and take my impression normal. The lower, much nicer impression. So I've, again, treat it like it's a complete where there are no teeth. So free end saddle, we've put the putty back there. Uh, and I've also put a little bit of putty at the front where I've taken that tooth out. The main reason I've done that is because I'm concerned that if I've just got the putty at the back, I haven't got that sort of triangulation that the palate gives. It's going to allow it a lot more of a rocking because it's just those two parts at the back and that could easily, I could overextend that down or push it down too much and then have the, the, the heels of the impression lifting up and not getting an accurate impression there. So I've added a little bit at the front just to give it a bit of a stabilizer so I know that it's going to go back in. And then I've got the alginate over the top there. So again, I've cut all the teeth out and then alginate on top. This one's a really lovely impression, actually. A little bit of overextension on that top left as you're looking at it. You can just see the tray shining through, but really nice, thick, rolled borders. Patient did great with his tongue movements. Uh, so he's really showing me the floor of the mouth there, which is great for us for planning that. 
And then we're going to take some secondaries the next time. So we've got some good trays made. That's the main thing. So up there, you can just about see up by that wisdom tooth, my little bit of light purple. So that's some putty that I've used. That's the Colts uh, heavy putty, I think it is. Uh, I hadn't got my hands on my gold and silver stuff yet. Um, so this bit of putty at the back there to support it. And then I've done my alginate over the top. Much, much nicer uh, impression because I had an, a pretty decent tray in the end. Uh, and the main thing is a much thinner borders. So if we wind back to there, look how fat and rolled those borders are those overextended borders we've now gone and we've done the border molding again so place that in we squeeze the lips cheesy grin opening wide wiggling the jaw left and right and we've repeated that two or three times and we've got a really nice functional mold of the teeth there the lower one again really really nice impression actually beautiful roll borders very compliant patient you know we practiced a lot to you know, do your oohs and ease and all of that practice it beforehand and of course the difference with the lowers we've got that tongue in the way so as i'm placing it i'll get to raise the tongue up to the roof of the mouth and then i'll get to go left and right all the way out and a good one is to try and get to push into the acrylic or push into the handle push that tongue forwards and that raises the floor of the mouth which is really important right down at the base down by the, the freedom of the tongue there. Because if you don't do that, every time they put their tongue forwards, the denture is going to come flying out. So really getting to do those movements, as well as the ooze and the ease and the opening and the wiggling the jaw as well. So really nice, thinner, skinnier impressions. And then what I also did in this appointment, which differs from the complete a little bit, is I did a preliminary jaw edge. So I did those impressions and I asked for my special trays. And I asked for a set of wax rims. Now, as we said in the completes, ideally you're doing your wax rims based on the secondary impressions, so they're better and you can have acrylic base plates. But for this, because of the complexity, I wanted to have two shots at it or have a chance of having two shots at it. So I asked for some rims. So how are we then going to do the rims? So the wax rims, again, as we covered in the completes, remember we're treating this exactly the same. So what we're using those for is planning aesthetics and planning how the patient is going to bite. Now, this patient, we need to think he doesn't know how to bite because he's been doing it wrong for who knows how many years and it's been a gradual change. You know, he didn't wake up one morning and decide I'm going to put my jaw forwards and bite like that forever. It went, you know, this tooth went, then this tooth went, then this tooth went and he slowly, slowly had to work on those front teeth more and then they ground down and then he closed up more. So it's been very, very gradual. So we've got to train him to get him back into his normal position. But let's take it back to the aesthetics first because that's what we're gonna do. So we said it in the completes lecture, we, what we do is we work for the aesthetics of the upper. We get the upper right first, that's for beauty. The lower is for the function. And that's when we start thinking about the bite. So with these teeth, obviously his upper teeth were too short. We saw that earlier. So how are we going to do that? This rim actually fitted over the top of the little bumps of teeth and things like that. But essentially, what I've asked him to do first up is I'm looking at that lip support and I'm looking at the cheeks and the buckle corridors, those spaces between the corners of the mouth, and I want to fill those out. Now, the difficulty here is bar the upper right one there, that's a denture already, everything else, the tooth is still in place or something is still in place, the roots or that submerged upper left one. So that bone, apart from the upper right one, hasn't shrunk back yet because the tooth is still there so actually we don't want to put too much wax or finally acrylic in that position at the front because actually it's not been lost yet we're not replacing that volume so we had to be careful not to add too much there so we're adding into that area making sure it's supporting it but not overdoing it pushing him forwards and then what i start to look at is the length of the teeth so we wanted to increase that length. So how are we gonna do that? I wanted to look at a few reference points for planning it. So obviously this is before we started treatment. So bearing in mind the sixes, the upper sixes and that lower central are gone. 
So I look at this and say, right, what are my reference points? And this is what I've said to my lab when I've requested these rims. Okay, so I've taken the imps and I've requested the rims and I've sent him these photos. Yeah, we have a Dropbox. We communicate, you know, all the patients in their different folders. And I said, right, you've got these teeth here, which I like the look of. I like the length of these teeth. Yes, they've maybe come down a little bit with that dento alveolar compensation, but actually, you know, they look actually quite natural when you see him smiling and things like that. So I said, like, I like these teeth on the top. So please match that rim as best as you can to the height of those two teeth there across the board. And then on the lower, we've got the opposite teeth, the lower right, four or five. Again, I like those. Uh, the lower right three isn't too bad, but just a little bit worn. Again, use that sort of mind's eye to think, you know what, if I put a canine tip on that, it will probably look all right. And the left three isn't too bad either. So that upper, I've said, match to that left side. And on the lowers, I've said, right, match in against the height of those teeth. And just imagine, if you can, that some incisors are there too. So that's what he sends back to me there. And then what I've done then is I'm going to adjust that to get it more or less right with those teeth there. So you can just about see the upper left four and five there. Um, so I've trimmed that rim. So you're happy with the length of the teeth that he shows at rest and when he's smiling. So he's quite happy with that smile there. And he's a little bit trapped because it's a little bit thick, but I can only make the wax so thin. And then the next thing we're doing is we're just gonna check how his occlusal plane is. So that's the relationship of the teeth in regards to the jaw itself, so the mandible, uh, the maxilla, sorry, and then we'll do it for the mandible on the bottom. But again, start with the top of first. I've not touched the lower rim yet, that's still in the box. So what we're then gonna do is match in the rim with his eyes, his interpupillary line, and then his alar tragus. So the front to back is the alar, the corner, of the, uh, sorry, the corner of the nose there, and the tragus on the ear. And we're going to match that up by using this thing here, exactly the same as the completes. So this is the bite plane, Fox's bite plane, that inner horseshoe you're placing up against that rim. And then you're checking with the front part of it there that it's lining up with the interpupillary line. And then the wings that go backwards, you're lining up with the alar tragus and making sure it fits nicely there. If you feel like one of them's off, you're going to just trim the denture. You're going to go back with your wax knife and trim the wax rim again, test it again. And then once you're happy, they all line up. We can mark on our center points and things like that. So we've just seen them there. You can see one nicely there, that center line, midline of the face, that photo is so valuable for the technician to see that that's lined up. We also mark his high smile and we mark where the canines are, which is typically from the inner canthus of the eye down the nose. And that's usually where the tip of the canine is. So again, we'll do all of that. And then we get this chap out or something to measure the difference between the jaws. So at this point, we're happy with the top one. We're going to put that lower one in as well and make them work. Yeah. So what we're looking at is the freeway space, which is the difference between the teeth when we're biting, the OVD, and at rest, the RVD. And you want that typically to be about two to four millimeters. So we're going to adjust it until we're happy. But what position are we getting into bite in? Because this bite here, as we say, he hasn't really got one. If he closes right up, the teeth at the front are all touching. But as I said, that's wrong. You know, he's pushed his jaw forwards. It's not the correct position. So we haven't got what we call, we do have an MIP or an, um, uh, yeah, the MIP there, that maximum intercuspal position, even though there's no cusps, but we've got that static occlusion, but it's not correct. So I want to put him into something better, uh, more reliable, repeatable, which is as we discussed in the in the completes, I like to do the RCP, which is the retruded contact position. So the jaw as far back as it can and what position it meets in. Again, as we said in the completes, you can get fancy and try something called Gothic arch tracing, which finds your centric relation. But actually for this, something like this case, too many mobile teeth and things would have been pretty tricky to do. If you want to listen to that episode two of the podcast with Alan Bergen, get it wherever you get your podcast. It's on Instagram, it's on YouTube. Um, so that's a bit of denture homework, if you like. 
but all I did for this chap was RCP, it's so that retruded position. And again, all I really do a lot of the time is I get the patient to open nice and wide, put their tip of the tongue all the way back to the roof of the mouth and try and close together. And if you practice doing that now, you can actually feel some tension at the back of the jaw as you're pulling it there. So just opening wide, roll the tongue back and pull it back. You can feel the tension as you're pulling those muscles back there. And then I'm getting him to do that as I'm using my bite gauge there. I'm using that in that position, roll the back, bite together, measuring it and relax. And it should drop by two to four millimeters. Repeat it again, roll it back, bite, measure it and release, measure it. Repeatable two or three times. Is he swinging back and doing it? Yes, great. And once you're happy with that, you can then set the bite together. As we said, the nice thing, and this is similar to the complete case, is yes, we're trying to get all this extra room. And you might think, well, how, how's he going to tolerate that? But actually, when his jaw is in this correct position, because again, as we said, as you overclose, it closes up that way as you push forwards. So actually, when we've retruded him backwards, we've naturally gained that extra space. So actually, it looked really complicated. Uh, and I was actually chatting to, to Ricardo, my technician who made it before we we're talking about another case and said, oh, I'm doing this case tonight. And we remembered at the time thinking this is going to be really, really hard. But actually, he was really compliant and we planned it well and it went really smoothly. I actually didn't need that second jaw edge appointment, but he actually tolerated it really well. So we're going to then set it all together. So you can see my drawings, my marks of those midlines and so forth. And then I put my little notches into the top and bottom, little V-shaped notch or a sort of, you know, tent-shaped notch. And then we've got him to roll the tongue back, bite together in that position. And then we've syringed the oclufast in this place. You can use blue mousse. I use a silicon like that. And that then just sets. It gives imprints of the teeth, shows where those notches are. And then it all comes out in one piece and your technician can put it all together. And again, we use that little graphic before. He's then going to look at that length of the teeth and add them on. For this, you can then look at using something like this for the gums. So this is a gingival shade guide. You've all seen like a Vita shade guide, a gingival shade guide, which you can use to get excited. This is an immediate case, so we didn't use this too much. We used a quick reference, but we didn't get all the different stains and tints out and do the veins and all sorts like you see on some of the complete work. And here he is with the wax trying. So we, you know, we, we're trying this out. Ricardo was quite happy that it looked about right. So we didn't do that second jaw edge. And actually, as we can see, I've made some slight tweaks to this and almost used the wax rim as the definitive, uh, the wax try and sorry, as the definitive jaw edge. So when I'm looking at this here, I'm not quite happy with his right hand side. I think the right hand side is slightly higher up. I want that to be a little bit lower down. I really like on the left, how the sort of central lateral and then canine tip is just following the lip. I feel on the right, it's maybe a little bit low, but it might be how his lip is there. But I had a little tweak of it, but there's how it looks inside the mouth. It actually looks really good inside the mouth. And you can see we've got plenty of room and he's, he's pretty comfortable with it. Obviously it feels a bit alien being wax, but he's quite comfortable with it all in that position there. And all I did was just tweak up these teeth on the right hand side a little bit after doing these photos. So I took photos of the reference for him and say, look, this is what you sent to me. This is what you think. And then I've just moved the teeth up a tiny little bit, just melted them in the wax and moved them up. And then I redid the jaw edge. I said, look, this is the position that I want him to, to be in. And that's actually quite nice to do anyway, because what can happen is you've got those blocks of wax in last time for the registration, and that can be quite alien feeling. And then when the patient suddenly has something that feels like a denture, they bite maybe in a slightly different position or the jaw comes together slightly differently and you might get a little interference, particularly when you're changing the way their jaw is meeting. Just it can be a slight little cusp angle on a molar. It then just knocks the jaw or something like that. So it can be quite handy just to do your registration again. Um, and it looked like something simple and easy. So Ricardo just tweaked it for me and got them made. So we've not done anything too fancy because it's an immediate. We've added on couple of clasps so you can just about see uh, on your left um, the a little clasp around that submerged eight and then in between that four and five we've got another little sort of ball style approaching clasp there just to help that but just some nice simple teeth nothing too fancy.
and then on the lower uh, we've got just a nice little simple clasp there and um, yeah simple sort of good extensions but nothing too drastic and fitting it in so on this this is on the day of fit so I've done the surgery so there's a little bit of bleeding around and then what I've also done is I've added some composite onto that lower right um, lower right three the lower left two to build out that contact point and the upper left three to replace that wear. So again, that's something I had to think about when I'm doing my secondary impressions. Do I need to do these before? Can I do these later on? Can I do them on the day? So the upper left four, that needed a fill in. And that area you saw it was on that mesial and the root, that area is important to have defined in the secondary impression. These front three teeth, it was all cosmetic stuff on the incisal edges. As long as I'd left myself enough space, it was fine, I could do it. If it was more around the back, for instance, where the denture is going to sit up against, I needed to have done that beforehand. But I thought I'd rather actually do these three bits on the bottom on the day of fit. So I took the teeth out on the top. The bottom was pretty much already set. Took those upper teeth out, fitted them both, and then I could have with the dentures in, and do the do the edge bonding essentially to do it there. So this is the one bit of composite you'll see on my Instagram. And let's just recap and a little transition. I remembered we had a transition video this time. A little recap of basically what we've done and how it's worked. So I've tried to keep the lower teeth in the same position so you can see the difference. The key thing with this is look at the position that the patient's nose is in. The bottom teeth stand the same. Look at the position of the nose in the afters. The nose is much higher up because we've increased that space um increase that space as my headphones aren't working for some reason swap um we've increased that space there and that's allowed that shape uh, to improve the upper teeth the patient was actually really really happy i've got a random point about now so there he is afterwards so that's fantastic and then there he is again so really, really happy with the, this is a two week review. He's really happy with it. And he came back at that point, really used to it. And you can see much more confident with the smile as well. And you can really see the difference again, same as we talked about a couple of weeks ago in that lower facial third, much less of wrinkles and things like that. We filled it out. We've increased that. The eyes are much brighter because again, we filled that area out and a bit of confidence as well. He was really thrilled. Same again, we've done an immediate. So top tip for checking immediates or relining it. So at eight weeks, I see him again. This is included in the cost of my private immediate dentures. Uh, in the NHS, unfortunately, you probably wouldn't do this because you're not getting paid for it. You'd see them at 12 weeks when you can open a new course of treatment and just do a reline. But I've done this as a soft reline because the gums and the bone here, remember we said we can't have it too thick because the bone hasn't been lost, but actually doing that number of extractions at the front, it's gonna shrink back quite a bit and we're gonna lose the fit at the front and it's gonna drop down. But also I've got a very thin part there, I wanna thicken it up. So I've used uh, the same as I did before, Visca gel, which is a soft temporary relining material, but I wanna know again, how much to put. So I've used a little bit of medium silicon here and placed it in. And this lets me visualize where those bits need to go. And there's my visca gel in place. And actually you can see on the bottom right, we've got a little bit that's gone into the healing socket uh, of the six as well, but that's just allowed it to fit that little bit better. And annoyingly, actually, um, we did too good a job with this chap. We actually saw, you know, the plan was to have done his second set of dentures by now, probably I think about September, because I think I saw this guy, we started in about January of last year. And I've seen him twice for checkups and he's super happy and they fit great. And he doesn't want to get the nice fancy ones going, which is a bit annoying. Um, but no, he's super thrilled. So I hope that made sense. A bit of an interesting case. If you've got any questions, I'm happy to answer them now. If you don't want to ask them directly, um, send me a DM on Instagram. I always try and get back to you. If you want to check out the podcast or any of the content, the newsletter, signups and things like that, impressionclub.co.uk. Cheers, guys.